Super Bowl 57, Kansas City Chiefs, Philadelphia Eagle. I missed all the new Super Bowl ads that come out every single year. One comes out and boldly claims that you can shop like a billionaire on their platform. This is Timu. Timu is a Boston-based app that was launched in the United States in September of 2022. It positions itself as a platform that offers steep discounts and incredibly low prices because unlike Amazon or Walmart, which marks up prices as a middleman, it allows you to buy directly from suppliers in China. The Super Bowl ads reportedly cost around $14 million, but the impact they had was immediate and significant. Data reveals that there was a 45% surge in downloads and a 20% increase in daily active users the day the ad aired compared to the days prior. But the spike in interest wasn't fleeting. Timu's downloads continued to grow, peaking as the most downloaded app in the Google Play and Apple Play Store and outpacing even US retail giants like Target in web traffic the following year. This is in large part due to its unique and addictive blend of gamified shopping and social media integration. Timu leverages the power of social media and referral programs, which incentivizes users to invite their friends, family, and whatever audience they can find online to the platform. This essentially turns its user base into brand ambassadors. The referral program offering spending credits for successful invites adds another layer as users benefit from both shopping and growing the platform's reach. This is PDD Holdings, more commonly known as Pinduoduo. This is the parent company behind Timu. Founded back in 2015 by Colin Huang, a former Google engineer, Pinduoduo quickly rose to prominence, challenging established giants like Alibaba in China. Its unique selling proposition lies in its integration of social elements along with deeply discounted deals on online shopping. Sounds familiar? The model not only revolutionized e-commerce in China, but also attracted a massive user base, propelling PDD to become one of the fastest growing tech companies in China. However, Pinduoduo's rapid descent was not without controversy. The company faced allegations of hosting third-party vendors who were selling counterfeit goods and engaging in fraudulent activities. But the most damaging incident was the discovery that there was malware present in the app, creating vulnerabilities that potentially compromised user data. The malware was reportedly capable of executing unauthorized transactions and accessing sensitive personal information, including payment details and IP addresses. This revelation caused public uproar, raising serious questions about Pinduoduo's commitment to user security and data privacy. The situation was made worse by reports that suggested Pinduoduo was slow to respond to these security concerns, which further eroded their public trust. With mounting pressure from Google and Apple, who claimed Pinduoduo had violated their user privacy policies, the company was forced to withdraw its app from key international markets, including the United States. In March, Google suspended Pinduoduo from its Play Store after finding malware versions of the app. The Pinduoduo scandal, while significant in its own right, is just the tip of the iceberg in a much larger conversation about the practices of Chinese tech companies and their handling of user data. These concerns are not just about the technical vulnerabilities or the isolated incidents of data breaches. They are deeply rooted in the systematic differences in how data is perceived, protected, and utilized in China when compared to the United States or other Western countries. China is a landscape where the rules of data governance are markedly different and where the rights and protections of users to control their own information are often overshadowed by broader national objectives set by the Chinese Communist Party. In the following sections, we'll explore the landscape of Chinese technology and data practices more broadly. We'll also examine how these principles governing data security differ in China when compared to the West and what this means for American users whose data might end up in the hands of these Chinese tech companies. Before we dive into the intricacies of Chinese tech companies and their global implications with data, it's essential to understand the historical evolution of private enterprise in China. This background is key to grasping how today's Czech giants operate within the unique framework of China's economic system. Under Mao Zedong, China's economy was strictly controlled by the state. All means of production were state-owned, and private enterprise was virtually non-existent. This command economy, while achieving certain milestones in terms of industrialization, was marked by inefficiencies and a lack of innovation. This was culminating in the Great Leap Forward, which was the biggest tragedy to emerge from this period, as Mao's policies attempted to force industrialization on a largely agrarian society who was not familiar or trained in the subject, resulting in an estimated 30 to 50 million deaths. The post-Mao era, particularly under Deng Xiaoping, marked a significant shift. 
Known as the Gaiga Kaifang, or the Opening and Reform, China began to integrate market mechanisms into its economy. It reduced state control and eventually allowed the emergence of private enterprise. This period was characterized by economic liberalization, attracting foreign investments, and a gradual opening of various sectors to private players. The private sector emerged as a dominant force in China's economic transition, replacing many state-owned enterprises with more efficient and profitable private firms. However, the CCP's influence still persists. They have a state-owned banking system and a myriad of government funds, which heavily influence private firm operations. They also retain immense control in sectors that are deemed essential for national interest. And with the rise in popularity of the internet and technology in China, data has quickly become an essential part of the CCP's national interest. In the digital age, data has emerged as a resource as critical as oil once was, driving the new economy and shaping global power structures. China, recognizing this shift, has positioned itself at the forefront of the new paradigm. The comparison of data to oil, as highlighted by the Economic Times, is more than a metaphor. It's a reflection of the changing dynamics of power and wealth in the information age. Data, like oil, must be extracted, refined, and processed. However, unlike oil, data is a resource that doesn't deplete with use. Instead, it acclimates, continually expanding in volume and complexity. This characteristic of data presents unique challenges and opportunities. It requires sophisticated systems for management and analysis, and its value can increase exponentially with the right insights and applications. Yet, this also raises significant ethical concerns, particularly around privacy and consent. In China, with the rise of tech giants like Pinduoduo and Timu, are closely aligned with the data-centric shift. These companies have grown into colossal entities, not merely because of their technological innovation, but also due to their ability to harness and leverage vast amounts of data. For these conglomerates, data is not just a commercial asset, it's a strategic tool. It's used to drive consumer behavior, tailor digital experiences, and influence public opinion. But beyond commercial use, data has become a means of political influence and control. The CCP's collaboration with these tech giants has led to a symbiotic relationship where data serves as a conduit for governance and policy implementation. This intertwining of data acclimation and political power is reshaping global conversations about data governance. It's not just about how data is collected and used, but also about who controls it and for what purposes. Let's investigate two Chinese laws that have set the precedent in data handling and security in the country. The Data Security Law, which we'll call the DSL, and the Personal Information Protection Law, or the PIPO, which were both enacted in 2021. The DSL establishes a framework for categorizing data based on its impact on national security and regulates storage and transfer according to the data's classification and sensitivity level. These are distinctions which the law leaves undefined. This law aims to enhance China's control over data within its borders. It emphasizes the protection of quote-unquote core data, which it closely ties with national and economic security, citizens' welfare, and public interests. A major stipulation is that the law restricts the transfer of personal information to third parties and overseas entities unless they first meet China's data protection standards. Now let's look at the personal information protection law. The PIPL is interesting. It is China's first comprehensive legislation for personal information protection. It broadens the definition of personal information and imposes rigorous consent requirements for data collection, handling, especially concerning sensitive data such as health or banking information. The law also recognizes certain exceptions where prior consent is not necessary, such as statutory duties, emergencies, public interest news reporting, or information already in the public domain. Of these terms, however, statutory duties is left undefined, leaving observers unclear as to where these duties begin, where they end, and to what extent the CCP can collect data under the guise of performing its statutory duty. The PIPL also enforces robust compliance requirements just like the DSL. Companies must conduct regular self-audits to assess information security risk and implement appropriate policies and safeguards. China's DSL and PIPL both signify a strong state control over data, with an emphasis on national security and socioeconomic stability. It gives the CCP a broad range of ability to intervene when it comes to data privacy. 
As we've seen, China's laws focus on state control and the protection of collective interest. U.S. laws tend to focus more on individual privacy and the interplay between user data and law enforcement. While they both intend to address the challenges posed by the new digital world that we live in, there are stark political and cultural differences in terms of data governance philosophies. For American policymakers, it underscores the need for a more robust international data governance framework that can help us navigate these complex challenges. For American consumers, this interplay shows the imperative of being informed and cautious about how their data is utilized and where. In conclusion, the narrative of China's technological ascendancy and its tech giants is a complex one. It's a story that intertwines innovation with concerns about data control, privacy, and security. For Americans, understanding this narrative is crucial in making informed decisions in a digitally connected world.